There is no known mechanism. That's a given. And to that I say, so what? Look, folks, if we dismissed everything in our world that we couldn't explain, how much would be left? Not much that I know of. I teach biochemistry. A lot of the biochemistry I teach is still with an understanding of, we still don't know that yet. We're getting there, but we don't know that yet. So, without an understanding of what the underlying mechanism is, it's very easy to fall back on conventional wisdom, and conventional wisdom says the only known biology or the only known effect of radio frequency exposure is heating. So if it isn't heating, it's not. Maybe it is. Maybe it is subtle heating. Maybe it's, maybe it's more than subtle heating. Who knows? But there are other possibilities that exist as well. There are the potential to move electrons along molecules. There is the change in the heat shock proteins that Cindy mentioned earlier. There are changes in the levels of reactive oxygen species, free radicals, that damage molecules and cells. Or these free radicals, besides being damaging, are also very important signaling molecules in cells. That goes along with the information heading that Cindy gave you. There's a lot of information associated with molecules, and that information comes at the level of chemicals themselves. So while we don't know the underlying mechanism yet, things are moving in that direction. And hopefully, there'll be a greater understanding of mechanism as we move along. Now, this brings me to, to another area of contrary data, and that is a single paper can appear to have contradictory data. That was the criticism that Motorola leveled against my work. Because when I expose cells to radio frequency fields from cell telephones, sometimes DNA damage went up, sometimes DNA damage went down. And when I talk to May Swicord, May Swicord says, in his own physics engineering way, that sort of consistency isn't acceptable. And in my own biological way, I said that sort of consistency is what biological systems are all about. You have to understand how the work is really done and how cells behave to understand that this is it. This is cell behavior. There are chemical agents that can cause a decrease in something at one level and an increase at another. There are chemical agents that can cause a change one direction, increase or decrease at a short time, and the opposite effect longer time of exposure. Why shouldn't the same thing be the case with electromagnetic fields or radio frequency radiation? The work that I did showing increases and decreases is perfectly consistent with existing science. That science come, coming from the use of chemicals and the response of various systems, cellular systems or whole animal systems, to those chemicals. So no, it's, there's no inconsistency at all there. Let me talk the last few minutes about weight of evidence, because we hear about weight of evidence a lot. And weight of evidence is a way of weighing evidence across different modalities as they, they apply to a single causative hypothesis. So in this area, what we're looking at, or, or what people try to do, is say, look, what single causative hypothesis? Well, that radio frequency radiation or extremely low magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, will cause biological effects. And I'll argue that with anybody. Now, that's for a couple of reasons. If you look at papers in which weight of evidence is mentioned, nobody defines what weight of evidence is. What is weight of evidence? Number of papers, quality of papers. When I look at the, the papers that use the term, I don't have a clue. What they're, well, actually, I do, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But it's used inappropriately. There's no regard for not just weight of evidence. There's no regard for strength of evidence. Strength of evidence is just as important. So don't use weight of evidence unless you can talk about strength of evidence. Also, if you're going to really do a good job looking at weight of evidence, you have to critically evaluate papers. You have to look at the techniques, critically evaluate the techniques, critically evaluate the overall methodology, critically evaluate the use of controls, critically evaluate the, the data collection, critically evaluate data evaluation. It's not done. 
It's just not done in papers that deal with weight of evidence. Now, I want to give you a quote. There's a fellow named Sheldon Krimsky who was with the Department of uh, Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts. And Krimsky is a, no, a recognized expert in the area of weight of evidence. And he said, weight of evidence is a vague term that scientists used, use when they apply implicit qualitative and or subjective criteria to evaluate a body of evidence. It is a seat of the pants qualitative assessment. And that's his feeling as far as the, the this, this is how he views the use of weight of evidence in relation to scientific matters. The problem is this. When weight of evidence is generally applied in the area that we work in, it really is weight. It literally becomes weight. How many papers show an effect? How many papers don't show an effect? Which one has more weight? And if the papers showing no effect have greater weight, not in any technical sense, or if they have a greater number, they win. Boy, that's, that's really science, isn't it? That's a scientific approach as I can imagine. I don't think so. You don't use papers to cancel one another. Scientific papers don't cancel one another. If you use scientific papers to cancel one another, you're missing a tremendous opportunity to learn something. And so that brings me to a conclusion for you. What I want to do is give you another quote from George Bernard Shaw. So the moment we want to believe something, we suddenly see all the arguments for it and become blind to the arguments against it. None of us need to be blinded to anything. So here is my conclusions for you. In this field, as in all fields of science that I know of, and I've kept up with a lot over 40 years, there's good work. And there's bad work on both sides of the issue. The last thing I'm going to tell you folks is that every paper out there that shows a biological effect, by God, that's a winner. It's not. There's a lot of crap out there, scientific crap. But that's on both sides of the issue. It's very, very important to be critical. It's very, very important to remember that this is not an issue about anything but the science. Without the science, this, this issue isn't going to move anywhere. Emotion is good. Emotion will move things a certain distance, but the underlying science has to be there. Now, it is important that we have good papers on both sides of this issue. And the reason for me is this. All it would take for me is one really, really good, well-done paper, a paper about which I could find no fault, that shows a biological effect for me to believe that biological effects are real. I don't care how many negative studies would follow. We need those positive studies, the good ones, and we need the good negative studies to give us a complete picture of what's happening. How else are we going to know under what conditions something happens and under what conditions something doesn't happen? How are we ever going to de determine what dose is? How are we ever going to determine what critical parameters are if we don't look at both good and bad studies? What we don't want is to have industry dismiss the good work that's being done in this area. They'd love to throw that cloak of invisibility over the entire issue and make it go away. Well, the unfortunate thing for them is it's not going to go away. Many of us will see to that. But the unfortunate thing for us in the meantime is that we spend of all, all of our efforts trying to counter arguments and nothing ever gets moved forward. We don't get the money to do the work that we need to do. And we need that underlying science to help advance the issue. Thanks.